Yeah. Okay, sudah bet. Can I? Ah, yeah. Crypto, yeah. Um. Hello, Crypto sir. Hello, sir. Hey, you don't need to call me, sir. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, sure. Hey, how are you? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm doing good. Yeah. How are you? Right. So we have Adil here. Uh, Hi, Adil. And Amit. Amit is our AVP of Hisal. Hi, Dimitri. Okay. Good. Hello, Pia. Good evening. Hey. So how is it going on here? Like, uh, you have class, right? Uh, right now I don't have class. It's uh, it, it's a summer semester going on right now. So okay, okay. Uh, just work in a lab, work in my lab doing my research related stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not not much of a courses right now. But I, I'll start doing my courses once the fall semester starts. Yeah, cool, cool. So what was the yeah? What is the condition there like? Corona. Uh, corona. I, I, it's much better. It's, it's almost back to normal. People have stopped wearing. I think almost uh, half of the population was vaccinated, right? Yeah. Uh, the last time I checked, uh, almost like four to six percent of them have been completely vaccinated. Okay. Okay. okay so perfect. yeah, I mean, whenever I go outside, it's I find that I'm the only one, or a couple of me, yeah. a couple of uh, people around me are the only ones wearing masks. I mean, almost. All of them are maskless, <laughs> and even social distancing around it, it's not very. I don't think people observe it these days. Yeah. yeah. But in, in the case of it, like in India, the situation is very worse. Like, so it, uh, I think the third wave is going to start on uh, coming month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I hope people get vaccinated before that. Uh, yeah, the vaccination is very, very slow. Like around uh, only, I think in uh, in our state, like in Kerala, only yeah. there are like no one get in a, enough uh, enough appointment. Only two hundred slot are there to get vaccination. Oh, okay. Did you get vaccination? Yeah. 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 Just a minute. Okay. Sure. No, yeah, I'm good. How yeah. about you? You are in US, right? Uh, right yeah. now. Okay, fine. Yeah. Great. Where are you? I mean, uh, did you go back to Kerala or are you still? Yeah, I'm in Kerala right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. You are in which district actually in Kerala? Uh, I'm from Kolam. Kolam. Oh, okay, fine. Hello, Sachin. Uh, please inform your uh, teammates, okay? Okay. Just Sachin is from IC, right? I don't know. Uh, I think I've seen his profile on Facebook. I, uh, I think he's from IC. <laughs> okay. And and what uh, what do you study, Surabhith and Amit? Yeah, and you two are from IC, right? Yeah, I am from uh, mechanical third year. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Amit is he is from Meta, and no electrical, and he is the AVP of Pisa. Yeah, he is right now. He is in third year. Okay. Cool. I honestly expected most of the participants to be from um, chemistry. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello. Hey. Usually, how many people join this session? Hmm? I mean, how many participants participants uh, do you usually like hold in these sessions? Like maximum hundred, I think. Oh, okay. That, that's pretty huge. I'm pretty sure that must be for branches like mechanical, electrical. I don't know. Like, I'm not sure. Yeah, we can uh, only yeah. from second year and first year of IC. And mm -hmm. I think chemical also will be there. Ah, okay. Yeah. How are you guys doing your project and stuff in this situation? You have to complete your master's project or exploratory project and stuff, right? How do, how do you do that? Yeah, but yet it was deferred to the offline semester indefinitely, our exploratory project. Oh, okay. For this semester, they were saying that uh, let us see, like, they might uh, give us the chance to do it in some virtual mode, like a simulation based project. But uh, mm -hmm. most of the professors are of the opinion that let us wait until the college reopens, which would probably be okay. next semester, uh, six or six months from now. Okay, okay. Uh, apart from that, uh, the other students who are actually working with some professor on a project or uh, they are uh, part of something like Team of Data or they somehow need to use the institute facilities, they are getting permission to uh, visit the institute, but uh, they will have to make their own arrangement to stay. They are not given hostels. So if you are, uh, if you really need the institute facilities, then you can try and uh, go, but uh, it is not an easy process right now. Yeah, it's very inconvenient. I mean, you have to make your own arrangement just for doing the project. That's that's very infeasible, and I don't think it's very practical to do that with students. Yeah.
Yeah, it's nine, so we can wait for two minutes. After that, we can start. I guess we can start, right? Do we expect more people to join? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, hi, all. I'm Mohammed Ashik Khan, head of research innovation on Obis unit. So today we have our first KVD session. So Surabit will deliver the uh, welcome speech of uh, KVD session and he will give the introduction of our speaker. So hand over to you, Sripi. Uh, hello and good evening, everyone. I am Sripi and uh, today for the KVD session of Industrial Chemistry, we have with us Mr. Tito Sunil John, who did his integrated uh, ITD degree in uh, Industrial Chemistry and uh, graduated in 2009 from our institute. He, while in the institute, he also did research internships at the Indian Institute of Science the National University of Singapore and uh, the CSIR National Institute of Interdisciplinary Science and Technology. After graduating, he worked as a project assistant at the same institute, CSIR National Chemical Laboratory. Currently, he is a PhD candidate at the Department of Chemistry at the University of Florida. Uh, over to you, sir, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Mm. Thank you, Arshad. Thank you, Sarabit. And thank you for the introduction. Uh, Kind of feels weird to <laughs> give a talk at the university you graduated. So, yeah. anyway. anyway, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, there's one thing I wanted to uh, admit to you guys. I mean, while I was going through the, uh, the notice, I mean, regarding my talk. So, you, there's this thing that I will talk about entrepreneurship scope, but I'm not sure how much I know about it because. Uh, yeah, I must say that my PPT or the talk that I'm going to give, uh, I don't think that's going to cover much about entrepreneurship in chemistry because I myself haven't explored much in that respect. So, so I think it's better better I not talk about something I don't know much about. So with that, maybe I'll, I'll start the stuff. Um, okay. Um, I am actually not sure how this PPT will be relevant to people who are not from chemistry because I, mm, you guys can you guys can hear me right? I hope so. Right, we can hear. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, because I made this PPT and the talk that I'm gonna give, I means PPT. Uh, 
based on my experiences studying chemistry right there so i don't think it will be much relevant to people outside chemistry so i mean already uh, chemistry people are here we are not issues okay cool cool uh, i am here because i was the host so i am the only mechanical person maybe one other record uh, data otherwise everybody is chemistry okay and anyway, that, that, that's good to know okay so why i do chemistry i mean this is one thing i uh, had a lot of struggle with realizing while i was back in it bhu uh i joined it bhu chemistry in 2014 only for one particular reason and that's because it was an iit i didn't have anything else in mind when i joined iit mujhe 11th or 12th i passed 11th and 12th for uske baad mujhe 12 uh, koi iit jana tha that that was my sole purpose and uh, i honestly didn't know what what i will do after going to iit theek hai wahan jayega i had thought my mera life set hoga but after uh, coming there i realized the hard truth it, it's it's definitely not that way and i honestly didn't know what i will do in chemistry hmm? so i had faced this struggle and at least for the f- first couple of years i mean what should i pursue should i pursue chemistry because i was kind of confused if in pursuing chemistry because the number of people going from chemistry to core jobs or doing phd at that time was really really i mean the time i graduated the last um, the time even when even by the time i graduated the number of people going into phd or chemistry related stuff was really 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 low i mean out of a batch of like 14 or 15 only two of us went for phd and all the others went for non core jobs so i mean you you obviously uh, find the anomaly right i mean people don't people in chemistry don't usually prefer to go to chemistry related stuff so i was caught in that mm, so yeah that is a question should i pursue chemistry or should i some do something non core should i pursue coding should i pursue data analytics i was kind of confused with that so one particular thing or it's rather an idea that helped me uh, find out why i should and the new pursue chemistry was this idea it's called flow and and it's going to get a bit philosophical i i must apologize for that but i feel like i should say this because that's one thing that helped me uh, find out what i should do flow is a concept where uh, it's a concept that uh, when you're doing something particular you kind of lose track of the time agar tum kuch kar rahe ho you i mean i am pretty sure you, you guys must have explored that as well you doing something and you are so much into that stuff that you completely lose track of time and this usually happened to me while i was preparing for je in 11th and 12th so i kind of got a feeling now yeah so flow so i feel like i should be doing something that makes me realize makes me lose track of time so this essentially happened to me whenever i was studying so maha pe me decide kiya tha i will pursue chemistry because uh pursue chemistry or phd because that is an extension of studying that that's what i thought and that is actually the truth also i mean i will do something jisme i get so involved that i lose track of time so that's what actually um, help me decide to do phd or chemistry chemistry yeah. phd in chemistry so yes i mean the point of me talking about this was this is that i mean i'm pretty sure almost a good amount of you guys at um, i hope i'm wrong are confused with what you should do after 5 years so and i really hope you guys Mm, find that out before i graduate i mean it's it's, really, it's it's kind of really important but yeah okay so proceeding to my next slide okay so the presentation i'm going to make i'm going to present it's it's uh, based on the assumption that you guys want to pursue remain in chemistry and pursue phd so, I 
yeah it's 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 in that perspective so what can you do to make uh to make the most out of uh, the college in order so in order to have a better chances of uh, doing a good phd so first thing yeah obviously it's good pointer i mean obviously maintain a good pointer i mean people have said to me how much i mean pointers doesn't matter but it's absolute shit pointers really do matter so even if you want to pursue non core jobs or core jobs i mean pointers i mean they they always come on top right so always maintain a good pointer I and mean, it's, it's a very obvious point second thing internships i mean um mm, yeah try to do internships because they kind of give you uh the feel of how the industry or the academia looks act in reality once you graduate plus it gives you practical experience in a particular field so it's really 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 really, really important that uh, you do internships so uh it kind of doesn't matter where you do your internship as long as you do a good internship do i mean whatever you're doing uh, as long as you do it well as long as you do it well it kind of doesn't matter if you're able to um, make the most out of your internship while you are at it that's the best thing i mean pe- i have seen people say i mean for internships are better definitely because they are exotic and fancy but doing an internship back in india i mean even that that's not so bad if you provided if you're doing it in a sufficiently good institute and you're doing your work i mean well okay so but nevertheless people prefer to go for a core internship because they offer much exposure to both in an academia cultural wise and both and also in a kind of a gives you better experience of, of a better view of uh, how good things can actually be because let me be honest with you the kind of uh, research the research environment back in india i mean i i'm pretty sure you must have had a glimpse of that right i mean it's good it's good in a very uh, lot of ways but it's good in a lot of ways but it's bad also in a very most other ways but doing a foreign internship gets you a more in experience about and at least gives you perspective about how things out there are so i'm going to talk a bit about uh, the popular foreign internships out there and i'm pretty sure you must have heard a lot of a lot about this so that that it's a collaboration between the between germany and india and it actually offers you funding mm, and i don't i'm not sure about housing but i think they give you the money for housing but yeah it all it's a food, uh, fully funded internship that helps you do your internship in germany so mytax it's actually collab- it's a, it's not a collaboration though it's a, it's an organization in canada and that helps uh, that gives you a fully funded scholarship in canada i mean yeah and it pays you really really well and you know so charpak is for france and snbos it's it's a collaboration between us and india so hmm, all of these programs they are really really prestigious it, if you are a charpak scholar if you are a mytex scholar if you are a dad scholar or snbos scholar i mean it's that by itself is a very prestigious thing and that by itself is going to add a lot of value to your application when you are when you are applying for a phd and of course it feels good to be <laughs> uh a charpak scholar or mytex scholar plus they uh, pay you a lot while you are in college itself so but the sad thing about these three things or the these four are that they um they are a, they are very competitive it's it's kind of very hard it's extremely hard to get into this uh, 
uh, get these uh, scholarships. Like I have seen all throughout my five years in IT, which I have seen only like or no only about like four or five people who got into uh, got a MITAC scholarship or on Sharpex scholarship even less. I have seen only two or three people get Sharpex scholarship. And as and goes, I mean that only goes I don't know two people or something. So compared to all these three dad that has I have seen like ten or fifteen people get dad scholarship. So that has a better acceptance rate with respect to the applicants and with respect to applicants. So you have a better chance when you apply to that. So the last thing with respect to uh, getting a foreign ownership is that uh, you mail the process. In all of honesty, I will say you have a better chance of grabbing a foreign internship when you are uh, directly mailing the process. Although the chances aren't very high, but that's very, very high compared to, it's, it's much better when compared to the programs. So, um, this process of mailing profs for internships, it's really tiring. It's gonna be really, uh, what, hope sucking. I'll tell you statistic. Uh, when I when I had applied for when I was applying for my internships when I was back when I was in my third year or second year, so I remember I sent like hundreds. I I sent like hundred emails to profs abroad, and I usually get like ten replies, and like eight of them they are straight no's. They'll tell you that you we can't take it. We don't have enough funding. I mean I'm really sorry for that. And yeah, but. And two, of, two out of those 100 emails that I sent, they will be like, either there will be acceptance or otherwise there will be, we will accept you, but you have to take care of your, fund, your own funding and we can't fund you. We can accept you into your lab, but we can't fund you. So, yeah, I mean, this, that even the process of getting a foreign internship is, the point is that the process of getting a foreign internship is, is that you need, a lot of hope, a lot of ambition, and a lot of uh, hard work to get into. You need to send a lot of mails. You need to modify your resumes, particularly for maybe each lab. You need to write a very good letter to the profs. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, the third point about what you can do make the most out of while you're in college is uh, publications, obviously. With respect to uh, PhD applications, publications or papers, they come at the same level as your grade pointer. I mean, the first thing a PhD committee looks at while you are looking for while looking at your applications is the is your grade point definitely, and along with that is publications. I mean, publications are a written proof that this guy or this girl he or she knows her research, knows her stuff. And I mean, at least he or she knows the stuff he's gonna do. I mean, he, he know what he knows about PhD. I mean, he knows what he or she is getting into. So publications is a written proof of that. I mean, so it's really, really re relevant and they do get a publication. But to be honest, it's, I feel like getting a publication while you are back in college is kind of more difficult than grabbing an internship. But nevertheless, try your luck, try your best while while uh, while you're back in college. Yeah. So my last point regarding this is that uh, is some very much related to the third point publications. The projects at college, I I guess you guys do three projects. I'm talking, uh, have my, the five year program in my mind when I'm talking about this. I guess you guys you do three projects, exploratory project. You have a project in the middle. I don't exactly remember the name of. And the last project, the master's thesis, right? So most people kind of have a uh, meh kind of attitude towards all this. I mean, they don't care much about it. They just see it as a kind of a, course to pass right i mean 
in EC course to pass. But if you honestly work well during that project, which normally people don't, because they have courses and other stuff to do. Uh, yeah. Okay. People don't, don't usually work hard, but among all these four points, this is, I feel like projects at college are the most underrated thing uh, people consider. Right. So you actually, have, I mean, the projects you do at college, they have the highest chances of giving you a publication or giving you the most experience about the research that you're going to do. So, I mean, see, if you analyze it with respect to the time you spend in labs, the amount of time you'll be spending at an internship, they won't be more than like two or three months, definitely not more than three months, right? But compare that to the projects you do at college, which, which people don't care about much, you are practically living there, living there for like three or four, I mean, I wouldn't say three or four years, right? So you actually have a full lab at your dispense to do your project. So, but people usually don't see it that way. I mean, they see this stuff as very redundant and time consuming. So my point here is that the projects in college are really underrated and but at the same time, they have the, they offer you the most chance of uh, grabbing a publication while you are at it. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that, that's my point. Okay. So, hmm. job prospects. Hmm. This is something I really wish somebody had told me while I was back in first year or second year because I didn't know about what I should do in pre-chemistry that uh, after these five years, I had absolutely no idea. I used to hear about people say GRE, TOEFL, PhD and stuff, but those ideas never connected in my mind. I It's only when I was back in third year or fourth year that I completely got an idea of what these stuff are. Okay, so yeah, job prospects first, of course, known core, you can go for a uh, an MBA, you can go for a, a job in data analytics or you can go for a job in coding. Uh, yeah, so I honestly won't offer much in that regard because whatever I'll be talking about with respect to non-core jobs, it will definitely be an outsider's view. And and I'm not always, I, I mean, I, I don't want to, as I told you in the meeting, I don't want to say about stuff that I don't know. So core jobs, that, that's something I can maybe talk about a bit. So yeah, in core, if you, pers if you wish to pursue chemistry after these five years, you have two options. Either you go for an industrial job in India or you do a PhD. Uh, practically, these are all only options after these five years if you wish to do PhD. Okay. So let's come to the first point, industrial jobs in India. So there are industrial jobs in India. A lot of, I know a couple of people who work in industries, not, not our alumni, other people that I come across. So to be honest, it's, there aren't much opportunities with respect to industrial jobs in India because, uh, just because they don't know, they don't do much in chemistry, R and D in India. That's the only reason. So because of that, we, as a nation in India, I mean, they, we do, I mean, it, the scope for chemistry graduates to pursue chemistry-related job back in India, it's it's very very limited. Plus the salary also, it's it's not that great. I mean, I. And with respect to jobs also, I did, uh, I worked in CSR and CLSA project assistant for nine months. And I kind of see it as an industrial job, although it's technically not very industrial, but 
i feel like as an iit graduate you definitely deserve something better than that so you can definitely go for uh, go for industrial jobs but i wouldn't really recommend it much though. so the second option would be to do a phd okay i always used to wonder why hmm, people from cs people from any known industrial chemistry branch they directly get into good core jobs and they do well compared to the ic people so i have come to this conclusion that your study of chemistry for this five years they actually doesn't end after this five years in order to do good work in chemistry you actually need to do a phd i mean all the good jobs in chemistry all the best jobs in chemistry are offered to people who do phd so it's very rarely that you will find a great scientist or a good somebody who works really well in, who's doing really well in chemistry doesn't have a phd right so yeah that's the conclusion that i came to you would have if you want to do pursue chemistry if you want to do good in chemistry you definitely need a phd i mean that's that's kind of the unspoken uh idea out there so what can you do with with respect to phd so yeah either you can do your phd in india you can i mean of course it does uh, in, a, in a good institute in india of course it doesn't make any point that you go back to doing phd in a private college or some lower institute after graduating from iit which will that doesn't make any sense at all please don't do it definitely do it at in case you are doing uh, if you want to stay back in india and do a good phd definitely do it at a very premier institute like uh, maybe iit bomb any of the good iits or ias so what can you do to get an in, uh, get into a phd program back in india there are actually four options the first one is pmrf it's a very competitive i mean it was introduced like 3 or 4 years back or maybe less than that so it's called prime minister's research fellowship so it's offered to those people who are going to pursue their phd in iits or iisc or nits also maybe you apply for this uh, it's kind of a funding thing you apply for, you apply to this committee with the prospective project you want to work on the prof you want to work with the the, the college that, that you want to join and they, they kind of interview you and after that interview they decide if you they want to fund you or not and the sad part about i mean i wouldn't say sad but the challenging part about this pmr of is that it's very it's extremely competitive i had gone for pm i mean i had applied for pmr of while i was in my fourth year or fifth year and that time like 100 people had applied to PM, uh, for pmr of in chemistry the pmr of funding in chemistry and and that year either it was zero nobody got accepted or there was this, there was this, there were a couple of people who, who got accepted so getting pmr of fellowship it's it's right up there i mean yeah of course if you're doing a phd in uh, in india i mean pmrf is the top thing you can go for and it pays you really good also like for the first 3 years you are offered like 75000 per month or something that's that's for a phd student in india that's extremely high yes and for the last 2 years oh yeah by the way phd in india you do it for 5 years so yeah. the first 3 years you get paid you're paid 75000 per month and for the last 2 years you are paid like 80000 per month i think or uh, in case they didn't increase it quite recently so right but the problem with this pmr of it is extremely competitive but at the same time extremely highly reputed and yeah the other two um, gateways through which you can do a phd in india is through is, is that you qualify gate or you qualify jrf okay jrf uh, you qualify through you qualify to be a jrf junior research fellow by qualifying the csar net exam and 
both of these two are i mean they are very um, i to have tried writing gate and net exam they are a bit hard and it needs some quite dedication to pass them of course so yeah but the problem with gate and jr is that they don't offer you there of course great pathways for doing phd back in india but they don't offer you much scholarship they offer you like 25000 to 30000 and i don't think that's sufficient to live back in india so yeah um, yeah and the last thing is that you i, I feel like that, that that's a actually privilege you we guys have as it graduates if you are an it graduate if you graduated from it um, doing your bachelor's or masters i'm not sure what masters though but i did um, is pilot so if you did do your bachelor's in an iit you are directly accepted into the in you can directly attend the interviews for uh, interview for phd applications for certain institute like iit kharagpur iit roorkee or other institute so you are directly you don't have to, you don't need to qualify jrf or gate or pmrf you just have to be an it graduate and you are directly selected you don't have to write any exams or anything you are directly selected in that interview but you need to perform well in that interview so yeah that's actually a shortcut for if you are an it graduate and you want to pursue um, i uh, phd in india but that too doesn't pay well the pay for if you are an it graduate phd student is at par with what with, with what uh, if you are a gate or a jrf scholar okay so the second option if you want to pursue phd is you pursue it abroad so i'll talk about it in the next slide a bit more yeah and yeah this is another question that used to come up in my mind while i was back in college theek hai mai mai fourth year fifth year fifth year tak mai decide kiya tha that i will i will pursue phd but phd is only for like 3 3 years or 5 years and 3 years if you are in europe or 5 years if you are in us so what do i do after it i had absolutely no idea so yeah so this is actually the list of a couple of couple at least a dozen of people who did their okay can maybe focus on this point yeah the phd students who graduated from a particular lab in our in the university that i'm working i'm studying in right now so these are what the people are doing a lot of them are working in industries and there are a couple of people who are working as assistant professors so yeah that's the thing what do you do after phd 90% of the people after phd pursue post doctoral studies or mm, yeah post doctoral studies they do their pd so being a post doctoral fellow means you are a scientist or a professor but you are not right at the same level it's kind of like a preparation of i mean the final round of preparations for you to be a complete scientist or a professor you what you practically do in those when you are a post doctor fellow after you graduate your phd is that uh, you help a scientist or a professor you join his lab and you help him do his research you give him inputs with respect to the kind of stuff he can do and it's kind of like giving directions how do i put it hmm. you kind of give directions to the ideas that the professor wants to implement you like how do i put it yeah i uh, i don't know a better way to put it yeah the best thing would be you are a scientist but not a scientist per se but the the final step to being a scientist yeah that's how i would describe postdoc as 
So, okay. Uh, so what do you do after a postdoc? Yeah, and postdoc, it's, a, it's usually a temporary position and you can't be a postdoc for till the end of your life. You need to do something else. So people usually do their postdocs for like three years or maximum four years. And after that, they, um, they either become a scientist in an industry or they become an assistant professor. So if you want to pursue PhD in India, sorry, if you want to pursue PhD in chemistry and come back to India, the best pathway for you will be to do a good PhD, then do a good postdoc, and then come back to India as an assistant professor, preferably in a good institute. Right. So, yeah, the last point would be industrial jobs. I mean, all of the people who graduated from this lab, they are working in industry center. Uh, I actually don't know much about the environment they are working in or how much they are satisfied with their jobs in industries because I have no absolutely no idea about it. I am just coming across that idea, particular idea right now. But I, with respect to the pay they are having, they are pretty well. They are really good. And yeah that, that that's what I would, I would like to say and next thing okay how do you apply for a PhD position uh, okay this is with respect to uh, applying for PhD abroad uh, okay Amen. Uh, I'm see your raised hand yeah I mean, you can unmute and ask. I think it's by, it's by wrong. Yeah, I, I think he probably misclicked or something. Yeah, you can put in put your question in chat box. Okay. I hope he's okay. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, doing a job after PhD, I mean, it's pretty much doing a job back in India also. I mean, that I'm not. Okay, they definitely don't offer you free rooms and stay. It's a job, right? They give you money, you do the job, you find your own accommodation, you find your own ways to um, eat. So yeah, they just give you salary. I mean, I'm not sure about, I mean, definitely it will, the, the amenities that the companies offer, they're gonna be different from company to company, but uh, it's not very different from any, job you back uh, do back in india and the uh, estimate of the salary place uh, salary piece okay so i don't remember them exactly but it's definitely between okay I'm, and i'm saying this with, with respect to the pace they have in india uh, in us so the general pay for a postdoc is between 40000 and 50 to 60,000 US dollars per annum. And that's a, I wouldn't say that's a very high amount with respect to the living standards here, but it's pretty sufficient. It's, I wouldn't even say sufficient, it's above sufficient, it's good. And okay, and for the jobs after a PhD, they too are in the range of like 50,000 to, 60,000 or maybe 65,000 US dollars per annum. And yeah, that too, I mean, they aren't very high, but 
it's good enough it's better than good enough and yeah i hope i answered your question and maybe if you want to know more about it we can talk about it after the after the ppt uh okay okay how do i apply for a phd position yeah and as i told you earlier as i told you uh, told you earlier it's with respect to doing phd abroad and uh, not in india okay yeah so uh the kind the way in which you'll be doing phd's in europe and in us are completely different in europe the main difference is that there are a couple of main differences the first one is the duration in europe um, a normal phd lasts for like 3 years and exceptional cases 3.5 to 4 years but in us it's 5 years I mean, the standard duration of doing a PhD in US is five years, and in exceptional cases, it can go to five point five or six years. So, yeah, first is the duration. Second thing is the number of course works you do. In Europe, you don't do any course works at all. You join a PhD on September of two thousand twenty-one or two thousand twenty-two, and you are directly pushed into the project that you'll be working on. there won't be a warm up period or uh, i mean not not warm up period but the, uh, yeah warm up period or there won't be a cushion in to which you can lie into before getting into your uh, project to directly go into that uh, project so yes and you'll basically be working on that project throughout these three years for three point five years but in us it's kind of different it's 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 very different you directly doesn't go into a project you actually have to complete certain uh, number of courses before you officially start your phd so right now i i'll tell you my case so right now in the uh, in the university that i'm doing my phd i am not a phd student right now i am a phd candidate so i have i am not a phd student until my third year so for the first two years or maybe the 2.5 years i will be doing um, like seven or eight subjects i have to complete i have to pass these eight subjects with a minimum score minimum grade i have to pass them and after i graduate i mean after i pass the subjects i have to simultaneously work on some project that could possibly lead to a phd and at the end of my third year i have to convince my there's there will be a supervisory committee who will monitor you through for your phd i have to convince my committee that the project that i'm going to do or me as a person can do phd i mean isko phd karne ka opportunity dene se there is going to be it's going to add value to chemistry as a whole i mean that's there so right now there's no surety that i am going to graduate or graduate as a phd student right i mean i can only say with surety after my third year people usually pass 99% of the population usually pass but yeah let's not jinx it so yeah that's one main difference uh and the second thing okay and the another thing that i want to say about the phd in europe and us is that the advantage of being uh, one advantage of doing your phd in europe is that you have a lot of places to visit <laughs> to just schengen visa me like you can go to 25 26 countries so yeah that's definitely there and that's a very tempting thing to do phd in europe but at the same time 
okay i shouldn't say so shouldn't say about this i'm not very much sure about the salaries they offer for a phd student so i believe it's sufficient because i've seen a lot of people go to a lot of countries with the salaries they're getting so it's definitely is in a small amount i am pretty sure of that but i can't comment on it so i don't know much about it so yeah and in us if you are a phd student you are offered between um, 800 to 1100 dollars okay uh, 800 to 1100 dollars okay i won't say 800 yeah okay it's two okay so your salary per month in us if you are doing a phd would be around 2000 dollars plus or minus 200 it depends it varies from university to university and place to place so that too is uh, is good enough i mean i wouldn't say it's high or yeah bo good enough it's good enough for a single person unless you are a family i mean i don't know i don't think it, you you can survive with that money if you are a family if you come with your family but for a single person i believe that money is sufficient and you can save a lot a lot ne you can save yeah so yes and yeah let, let let's come to the point of this slide how do i apply for a phd in europe there are two ways 80% of the phd applications in europe occur through mailing you mail it, you find you go to a university or you go to the website of a prof you go through the kind of stuff they work on and if you are interested you can you mail them prof i want to do my phd under you i mean i like the kind of work you do and my kind of my interest kind of match with yours you mail him saying this you kind of uh, you send him your resume you you cv and if you are lucky enough that prof will accept you preferably with funding yeah mostly with funding and that's how it proceeds usually in that, that's a case usually in europe and it's very rarely uh, that i see a program in us program in europe that offers phd it's very rare i mean there are but either it's very competitive or it's very less in numbers there will be a program like the uh, held by an organization or a institute and you apply to that program you upload your cv you upload your other uh, required documents and uh, based on that they sort and give you they decide if you if they should fund you for a phd and coming to us uh the option of directly mailing a prof and applying for a phd is virtually non existent here practically non existent here because a prof can't directly give you funding for doing the phd in us us ka system kaisa hai ki you apply to a to an institute you apply to a university you, every university will have a phd program and it's to that port it's to that particular program that you will be applying and they shortlist you or they select you based on the merits of your application yeah that's how it works so yeah i've been telling you that you need to upload upload your documents and stuff so what documents do you usually need to upload or you will need uh, if you if you are applying for a phd there are this these are the main four stuff your five stuff that you need there might be a couple of additional stuff you might need but mostly they're optional so yeah the first thing the transcript the transcript basically it's your grade sheet of all semesters compiled into a single paper single sheet so that's one thing yeah we have some question mm, yeah yeah okay yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Mm, was working for platon core coding just to be able to certain in one of the course is there any way if yes but should that certain time be like within how many days okay uh
it's very rare that i have seen anyone go into a research specifically core research after doing a non core job and let me be honest with you it's going to be difficult because the kind of skills you will be acquiring while you are doing a non core coding job is going to be completely difficult i mean completely different from the kind of skills that are that will be required for your um, when you'll be doing your phd right so uh i honestly haven't seen anyone do this thing so switch from a non core job to a core job after four years or five years specifically in chemistry i haven't seen anyone do that so i am not sure if there exists any path but surely uh yes if you are doing computational chemistry or if you are doing if you are into computational chemistry yes you definitely can pursue that path i although in that case also i have not seen many people do it but that's definitely a viable path if you're doing a non core job non core coding job after you graduate and the there's a good chance or if you are the kind of skills you acquire during that period could be used if you will be doing a phd in computational chemistry i mean i believe you have a very very good chance uh, of doing uh, of uh, coming back to core and doing your phd sure i mean but this is with respect to computational chemistry but i'm not sure if uh, the same avenue can be open for other experimental levels of chemistry yeah I, and if uh, yes what what should that certain time be like um <laughs> as i told you i i don't know much many people who have switched from non core jobs to core job, core phd so but still if i have to give you an approximation most people start their phd's at least back in india before they are 25 or 26 years old so yeah that, that that's what i would say and i hope i answered your question Mm, okay mm what about the other variant is that more comfortable or equally difficult uh, uh by the other way around i hope you mean you do a phd in um, chemistry and then you go for non core jobs yes yes i think that's a more viable and more i i i i have seen a lot of people pursue that path um like i have seen a lot of people in computational okay uh, this two would be with respect to computational chemistry i have seen a lot of people in computational chemistry go work in data analytics or uh, coding jobs i have seen a lot of i mean that's kind of the trend in computational chemistry almost 60 to 70% of the people who are who do their phd in computational chemistry they either go for coding or data analytics or some job in that path and there is also one more thing that i had real uh, i have seen a although it's a very quiet small part of the spectrum some people choose to do mbas after uh, their phd's uh i don't know who it was i mean yeah there there, there are actually a lot of people who do mbas after their phd's and this um, i don't know uska kitna scope hai and how much viable it is but uh, i hope you guys know about perkin elmer it's a company that makes a lot of software i mean uh, chemical instruments uh, ir they make ir instruments they make nmr instruments they make a lot of chemistry related instruments so it's a quite big mnc in chemistry instrumentation so i guess their ceo or somebody who is on that level of administration there did his phd in chemistry and then he went on to do mba when went to do mba and then he 
he is their CEO. Yeah, and also while I, I uh, just came to my mind, while I was doing my internship back in CSA NIST, there was this uh, um, guy. He did his PhD in chemistry, and he too went and uh, did his MBA. Or uske baad he's doing. He's I'm not sure of the position he's holding. Is he too is in quite a good. Uh, administrative position in some good company in Japan. I, I don't know the name of the company. Yeah, the co name of the company is Noritake. And yeah, I believe he's in a very good position. And another by, uh, thing that you can pursue after PhD is, uh, okay, I should have added this in the slide. If all of this stuff is coming to my mind right now. By the way, that's a very good question you asked. Though, thank you for asking. So another thing that came, I mean, that you can do after a PhD, you can be a consultant. Uh, I have seen PhD graduates work as consultants in consultancy companies in BCGs, McKinsey, or any other popular com consultancy companies. Because these companies, they are uh, recruited, they are contracted to do jobs for other companies, right? So suppose um, Aramco, it's a it's an orbit British Petroleum. I mean they have some problem figuring out some stuff with uh, with respect to some something related to oil. And suppose they don't have the money or the time to spend that much that much resource on that particular problem. They so what do they do? So they recruit a consultancy consultancy company and they tell them, mm, we want a solution for this. We will give you this much of time. We will give you this much of money, find a solution. So what will the consultancy company do? They, they want somebody who has knowledge in that particular field. So since we're talking about British, BP, British Petroleum, they want somebody who knows about oil. So they will hire oh, people who have who did their PhDs in oil chemistry or something. So yeah, that's one avenue PhD graduates can pursue after PhD. Although the kind, the number of people, at least till now I have seen do such stuff are not very much. It might be because I haven't explored much in that respect. So definitely there exists that avenue. Uh, yeah. Okay, coming back to the slide. Mm, where was I? Okay, I think I told about transcript. Yeah, uh, I, I think I was talking about GRE and Uh Okay, so disclaimer here. Due to COVID, I think a lot of universities have waived off the requirement for GRE and TOEFL scores because GRE and TOEFL exams need your presence in their exam centers which is not very possible during this time so i think a lot of universities have a waived off GRE and TOEFL scores so yeah that's it i mean and and supposing that they will come back to effect once this pandemic is over i'll talk about them uh, so GRE make out there there are two sections mm, i forgot their exact names the one part will test you your English skills. I mean, how good you can, how you, how good you are in English. And the second part will test you how good you are in Max. So, yeah, that's it. I mean, usually for Indian students, the kind of Max questions they have in GRE, they aren't very hard. They are pretty simple. And if you are an IT graduate, I mean, there is, I mean, you are an IT graduate for, not for no reason, right? So the kind of max questions they have for, I, max questions they have in GRE, are, they should be pretty simple for you. But the English questions, they require a lot of study. They, if you want to seriously prepare for GRE, you should be looking to actually improve your English soft skills 
yeah that's what you should be eyeing for if you want to seriously prepare for gr and toefl that kind of uh, toefl is also pretty much similar to gre but without the max stuff they they don't test you your mathematical skill mathematical skills or anything they just they just test you how much you are good at english i mean if you will be able to survive you will be able to survive in us or europe if uh, if they give you visa that's a, that's a thing how much they how much you know english that's the mm, thing they want to measure through a toefl exam uh so you give gre and toefl exams and you submit their scores when you are applying for phd and the third thing it's a statement of purpose it's usually a 1000 or 1500 word document that you make where jahan pe tu bolte tu why you are interested in chemistry why do you want to work in why do you want to do chemistry why do you want to work in this particular field why do you want to work why do you want to join this in uh, this particular institute so yeah it's basically what the name says statement of purpose what is your purpose of doing phd that's that's the story that you have to tell in the document so even making that document it's not a easy task it's people usually take to make a good sop you need at least like definitely more than 3 or 4 weeks of dedicated working yeah and the fourth thing letter of letters of recommendation you will definitely need to maintain a good relations relationship with the profs you have worked under agar doesn't matter if you are in if it was an internship or it was back it was in a project back in college so you will be getting your letters of recommendations for that program from these profs so usually the programs in us ask for at least three letters of recommendation so maintain a good relations with your recommend i mean your uh, profs and publications usually they are optional i mean they are always optional the publications are always optional but if you have a publication that's uh, that's awesome i mean it kind of guarantees you a phd position there right uh yes i think i almost reached the end of the slide okay hmm. so ame bandotkar so i hope i'm pronouncing his name right so he i think he's a 2012 graduate from um, ipb chu industrial chemistry so after that he went on to pursue his phd in uc san diego university of california san diego after that he did his post doctoral studies in northwestern university and both these universities are really highly ranked university i mean they always come in like at least the top 25 or so in almost all rankings that exist around the world so yeah this guy is really great so i mean right now he's uh, he is an assistant professor in north carolina state university he is working on wearable um, nano chips or something i'm not exactly sure so i think this news came around like a couple of weeks back he has been selected by the mit technology review as one of the top 35 innovators under 35 uh yeah so he he he's one of them so and he's a graduate from your from our institute so i felt a <laughs> really nice reading this article and i felt i felt uh, like i should say this here because when i was at back in college i felt like there was no particular i mean there's no future for uh people who pursue phd after their idd you have seen i forgot his name the ceo of softbank he is an itbhu alumni but there are a lot of famous alumni itbhu alumni out there who are doing really well who 
who are really famous who are really rich but icc se koi nahi hai that's one thing i felt really sad about but then i came across this guy and now see i mean he has been selected as a top innovator by an by an mit journal so that's not a small thing that i mean the few have the this news actually made me quite uh, i mean feel positive about the future of ic yeah i mean there is another guy yeah, his name is abhur shankar he's doing his postdoctoral studies uh, i think he's a 2013 or 14 graduate i am not completely sure though so he's doing his postdoctoral studies in massachusetts in mit obviously you know about it and he too uh, is doing pretty well uh yeah with that i i would like to end my ppt thank you guys you can ask your doubt or you can put it the question in the chat box by the way i made this presentation as flat mic and i'm pretty sure it's very disorganized and i i'm not even sure if i was able to convey what i was i want to say yeah apologies for that sorry <laughs> Right, and uh, now I think if someone uh, does not have any questions, then we can wind up. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I mean, you can definitely contact me uh, if you need any help. Yeah, you can definitely ping ping me on LinkedIn, preferably LinkedIn. Yeah. Could you please tell about the projects? like you explored in the uh, college like under the props so um for my exploratory project i did uh, i did some work on nanoparticles under professor sh hasan so <laughs> i must honestly tell you i have honestly did nothing during that time i mean it was basically what the name suggested it was an exploratory project i mean it helped me understand some stuff so but i i mean i didn't do anything productive out of it the into i mean the internships i did in iisc it was a bit related to pharmaceutical chemistry about how drugs worked how to properly incorporate drugs into the tablets and stuff um i honestly don't know i'm pretty sure i mean uh, these things would interest you because my the kind of projects i did but anyway, anyway since you asked i'll tell you i mean it was about the kind of internship i did in iisc it was uh, yeah it was about drugs how to properly incorporate drugs into the tablets and the internship i did in nus that too was quite related to that i mean that internship was practically in pharmacy uh i mean it should have been a pharmacy related internship but yeah so it was i was studying the properties of uh, tablets how with different humidities the texture and the um, dimensions of tablets changed so yeah that was the internship uh, project back i project i did in nus and to be honest i didn't like these projects i did them because i had to do them i couldn't find much interest in doing them and the other two projects i did i mean in nist or the ncl they were a bit related to catalysis in organic chemistry so okay uh, uh, since you asked this question i i wanted to tell you something i mean till i joined my phd i wasn't sure what particular field in chemistry i wanted to pursue i 
I wasn't sure if I should pursue medicinal chemistry or inorganic chemistry or nanoparticle nanoparticle chemistry I was not sure about it I was but the good thing about the phd's in um, us the system of phd's in us is that you directly go uh, don't go into a project right you have for the first semester at least at least in our university you have the option to interview interview professors i mean the professors don't interview you interview the professors i mean what do you do i mean to actually know about the kind of stuff they do and at least briefly for some time work in that project to know if you are interested in that project so many times i have seen people get into projects i mean not in us definitely get into projects that are not interested in but then they gradually lose interest but i believe the system they have in us universities where you try out the stuff and check if you properly are interested in it before actually getting into the project is a good thing so that's actually one of the reason why i chose to do my phd in us yeah and currently i'm working on catalysis i'm working on uh the conversion of uh, nitrogen to ammonia that's what i hope to make phd yeah what is it like in the day of your life okay <laughs> uh i wake up by 8 or nine. okay i wake up by 8 or 9 i have my breakfast i go to a rich university by i bike i have a cycle i cycle to my university um, i start my work uh, so it's kind of not what i expected my phd would look like and i um, one particular cool thing about the <laughs> kind of chemistry we do is it's uh, it's one thing i really didn't i really saw something very premium um, in my in chemistry is that glove boxes okay uh, so okay i think i am uh, diverging away from what i supposed to say so yeah in my my day i work i work normally till 6 or 7 or sometimes if i have work i work till 8 or 8:30 so uske baad i come back i cook the food i read a bit watch a, watch a couple of youtube videos go back to sleep yeah that that's my that's how my days look like so what according to you would be your, uh, an advice to us like um i am a student basically i'm i'll be entering second year now so what according to you would be an advice so that we start exploring different fields in in core or in like how should we just start on exploring fields it's a good thing that you have uh, the syllabus in the institute offers you the opportunity to do multiple projects right so it's better you try to do this projects in different field maybe try your exploratory project in in organic chemistry under sh hasan maybe try to do your btech project under uh, kandasami in organic chemistry or maybe try to do your the next project in or your master thesis or some other project in battery chemistry and uh don't confine i mean see you have this attitude that you want to explore right so that by itself is is the greatest thing and while you are applying for internships also uh don't confine yourself to the um, idea that may is may he kaam karunga that's one thing i that's one mistake i made i mean grab any opportunity you find in chemistry if it irrespective of its in computational in organic organic that's 
yeah i mean that, that's what i would say i mean grab any opportunity you have to get a good scope in chemistry we need to be phd and no good scope after our idd um yes if you want to do good work in chemistry if you want to with respect to core if you want to be in a good position the number of opportunities you have after you graduated your idd are very limited i mean if not practically non existent so it's it's kind of yeah you need to do a phd I hope I answered your question, Kitesh. Kitan, sorry, and Muska. I think we are done with all the question. Anyone? Okay, fine. So yeah, one more question. What? Yeah, one more question is that what other than PhD we can do in core in IDD in job? Okay. Uh, can we do in core in IDD in job perspective and the estimated salary? Okay. So after um, I tried doing this, I tried to search for core jobs in a uh, after my after I graduated my after I graduated. Uh, I told you right, the kind of jobs are. Mm, i felt like we as an it graduate students we deserve much better jobs than the kind of jobs they have to offer uh, and the salary i'll tell you i mean on uh, for any entry level positions with respect to and as an chemistry graduate even if you are an iitm are very limited and i'm pretty sure there is an upper cap of like 30 to 32000 i have not seen an entry level job i mean Which pays you above thirty thousand uh, for a core job in chemistry, and yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's what I would, I would like to say. Any question? Is it initially we get less than and then it increases exponentially or something? Uh, in core, okay. I don't think they increase exponentially. See, okay, the kind of jobs that you get after IDD in core will be. the kind of jobs like laboratory technician project assistant the kind of job that i did or you will be operating a particular okay uh, you will be operating a particular machine and you will be paid for it and at least according to my imagination it's very difficult these are jobs that are very difficult to upskill there is a limit to the kind of skills you can acquire during this uh, jobs there's a limit to the kind of stuff you can learn when you're doing this kind of jobs so what's the incentive of paying you more if you are not um, learning more stuff just because there's nothing to learn right so what's the incentive for the company to pay you more just because you have been there for more years so honestly i don't think there would be a exponential salary increase as you do mm. oh yeah by the way yeah i i forgot to mention this uh there is particular revenue i mean if you uh, uh right gate or net and if you have a really good rank i mean by really good rank i mean within 50 or 25 or something all in the rank you can directly apply for internships at ongc and 
in DPC or HPCL. I'm not sure of HPCL though. Uh, you can apply to these uh, public sector companies and there's a good chance that you can get into this. And there's a 90% that chance that if you qualified these exams, there's a good chance that you can get uh, a good job there. And they offer you pretty well. And they offer you a lot of amenities also. Since it's a government job, it definitely is a um, good avenue to pursue. But as I said, it's that too is really competitive. Every year, at least, I, I don't know, I'm not sure about the number of people who write gate or net, but you need to get a rank at least within 50 if you you want to pursue these jobs. I I forgot to mention that. Sorry. Yeah. I, I hope I answered your question. And but with respect to the corporate jobs, I'm pretty sure they I'm 80 to 85 percent sure they don't exponentially increase or increase considerably. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Diamond. That is a good question. Thank you for the question. Okay, fine. Yeah. I think we are done. done. I think everyone uh, enjoyed this session. Thank you, Bhaiya, for this on the behalf of ECLI TBHU, and thank you for all attendees for making it interactive. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Arshad. Thank you, Arshad, for inviting me. It was, it was good talking to you. Yeah. Bye.